Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Cybersecurity 101. This webinar is presented by Ahola Human Capital Management and Myers Roman, Freeberg and Lewis. This webinar will be one hour in length and include a slide presentation and a worksheet which was sent in your webinar reminder email you received early this morning. Throughout the presentation, we will also encourage listeners to submit questions to our presenters via the chat function of WebEx. This webinar is being recorded and it will be emailed to all registrants with the presentation slides and the worksheet reference. Now to the introductions. My name is Michael Paul, CFO of the Whole Human Capital Management. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our webinar panelists today. On today's panel is Peter Bross. With more than 30 years of experience in the role of trusted advisor, outside general counsel, and legal resource to closely held businesses, Peter identifies business and legal implications associated with his clients' legal options and advises them of solutions that address their business and personal needs. He represents clients in a broad scope of industries, ranging from consumer and automotive companies to private equity groups and real estate developers and investors. Peter counsels clients in matters involving business succession, ownership and management issues, contracts, contract disputes, domestic and international mergers and acquisitions, real estate purchases, construction and development, recapitalization, sales, leasing, financing, representing both lenders and borrowers, and like-kind exchanges. His practice also includes matters involving cybersecurity, energy law involving oil and gas leasing, and related business transactions, renewable energy, environmental law, and computer and intellectual property law. Our second panelist is David Croft. As a former general counsel and chief operating officer, David offers a unique perspective on applying business law and understanding the needs of his clients. David's practice includes counseling businesses and entrepreneurs throughout Northeast Ohio to launch new businesses and purchase or sell existing businesses, reviewing investment opportunities, establishing internal governance mechanisms, developing agreements with customers and other businesses, preparing and negotiating business deals and contracts, and handling dissolution and liquidation matters. David brings extensive experience in the manufacturing industry and represents a diverse array of businesses, business owners, and entrepreneurs. David is the chair for the firm's blockchain and cryptocurrency practice and draws on his specialized technical and business expertise to represent clients in all as aspects of blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, including data privacy, cybersecurity, inventions, trademarks, brand protection, trade secrets, copyrights, commercialization, mining, energy procurement, and licensing. Our third panelist is John Hyman. John has spent his entire career solving employers' workforce problems, focusing his practice on management side labor and employment law. His experience covers all areas of labor and employment law, includes significant trial, trial experience at both boutique and general uh, practice law firms. John serves as outside labor and employment counsel for businesses by drafting employment policies and agreements, auditing human resources practices, advising on day-to-day -day employment issues such as employee discipline and terminations, monitoring labor relations and implementing union avoidance strategies, conducting workplace investigations, ensuring compliance with labor and employment laws and assisting companies with their cybersecurity conformity. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for being here. Let's get started. As you can see, we've got the agenda for the webinar on the screen. We will discuss why cybersecurity is important to business owners. We will read through a cybersecurity fact pattern based on a local manufacturing company and discuss the example in depth with our panelists. Then we'll wrap up and take questions from the audience. And with that, I'll turn the webinar over to Peter to get started. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> Good afternoon, and thank you for attending Cybersecurity 101. We all know how relevant our computers, devices, cell phones, and the programs and applications on them have become, both in our personal lives and in our businesses. You'll probably recall recently that Facebook was hacked. <clears throat> this wasn't the first time. The new normal is that it isn't just Facebook, Equifax, the U.S. government that are victims of data breaches, but it's also our Gmail accounts and our businesses that are also victims or are victims in the waiting. 
Today we will discuss as a first part of a three-part series on data privacy and security and cybersecurity, um, the issues or general issues of cybersecurity. We prepared a fact pattern that represents many uh, businesses. And although it's a manufacturer distributor, I saw that many of you have, are uh, owners or part, are work within service businesses. This fact pattern is also equally relevant to your business. So let's look at the fact pattern. Willis Reed Company, located in an industrial park in Cleveland, Ohio, is a manufacturer and distributor of widgets. The widgets are used in industry and by consumers. WRC's customers pay using credit cards, wire transfers, and checks. WRC also has certain products manufactured in China. Communication to and from the factory in China is done primarily through email and text. The manufacturer in China is not owned by WRC and has its own computer system and server that is located in China. WRC recently updated its equipment and is completely automated. The equipment is operated through embedded software applications. Part of the equipment operation and maintenance procedures require that the software applications are updated routinely through its internal Wi-Fi network. The uh, WRC has approximately 20 employees. 10 of its employees work in Cleveland, Ohio location. Other employees are located in several locations throughout the United States and some of them work from the employee's home. At times, WRC will hire independent contractors. Some of the employees, independent contractors, are provided company-owned cell phones and laptops. However, many of the employees and independent contractors use their own personal cell phones, computers, laptops, and the like when performing duties for WRC. The employees and independent contractors remotely access WRC's computer system to use applications and input orders and other information required to perform their work. WRC sells its widgets in the United States primarily. However, WRC intends to expand worldwide and has opportunities to sell into the European Union. Many of the orders taken by WRC are submitted through WRC's website. WRC recently hired a website development company to redevelop its website and to establish a store and online marketing strategy through a third party like Amazon. WRC has been hosting its website on its own server located in Cleveland, in its Cleveland, Ohio location. WRC purchases its materials used in manufacturing from vendors who are generally small companies. Some of the vendors are outside the United States. Many of the vendors require that WRC order its materials through their websites. All WRC company information with regard to the business are stored on its server. Also, customer lists and contact information obtained when taking orders and the methods of payment are also stored on WRC's server. WRC's president has been considering storing company data and transactions in the cloud, but isn't sure exactly what that means. WRC's accountant has advised that WRC use an accounting application that is in the cloud. The application is licensed from a well-known accounting software company located in the United States. The accounting software company also arranges for data storage. WRC has been approached by a potential large customer to manufacture a product line and also distribute its product to its customers, who are primarily uh, consumers. The new customers' products are sold to uh, customers in the EU, Canada, and the United States. The new customer provided WRC with its master manufacturing and service agreement. WRC's president was reviewing the agreement and noticed that there are four pages under the section captioned, data privacy and cybersecurity. The president of WRC is confused and is not sure what the next step should be. So David, um, are cybersecurity and data privacy issues uh, an issue for WRC? It, absolutely. Um, it, the, 
this fact pattern, I'm just going to uh, reiterate what you already said, Peter, when you, when, you, uh, when you introduced this fact pattern. This, while it seems absolutely ripe with, with issues for data privacy and cybersecurity, it really does um, reflect, I would say, most, if not all, of the businesses that, that we work with um, in just about every way, uh, whether it's from uh, connecting their equipment to the Internet, um, to uh, having employees that, that are using their own devices, um, to working within the EU or uh, working with a manufacturer in China. There are a lot of different um, issues here uh, or potential um, situations where data privacy and cybersecurity should are, are certainly an issue. Um, and I think, so we've, I've highlighted just a few, and that's, it. so we've talked about it, they're, they're, they're working, they're, they've hired a manufacturer in China, so they're working in China. The manufacturer that's located in China is not owned by WRC. Um, they're using equipment that is connected to and being updated through uh, their Wi-Fi network, their internal Wi-Fi network. So in other words, um, that, that's, manufacturing IoT or manufacturing Internet of Things. Um, we've got employees, uh, about 20 employees. Some of them are working from home. Um, some of them are independent contractors. Uh, some of them are using company-provided devices, but some of them are using their own, provided, uh, their own devices and accessing um, Willis Reed's network either, either through the, uh, the, the physical location or remotely. Um, We've got the intention by WRC to begin to sell their, uh, their wares in the EU. We've got them taking orders on a website. We've got them storing their business information as well as the information that they're collecting through their website on servers housed in their, uh, their, their facilities. And they're intending to uh, connect to the cloud. So is, is our cybersecurity and data, data privacy an issue for WRC? Absolutely. In a, it, they, it, so, because of the fact that a lot of its business is done through the internet, mm -hmm. so Michael Ahola, being a leader in its in its um, uh, industry, has Ahola addressed cybersecurity issues and data privacy issues. We have, yep. I mean, that's obviously um, something critical in our business. We're dealing in information, and, and most of it, not all of it, very sensitive information, social security numbers, and bunch of uh, personally identifiable information. So yeah, so Ola has a number of practices in place. Um, as an organization, uh, generally, we, we like to adhere to best practices throughout. Um, this area is no exception. Um, one of the things that we do that, that's really paid dividends for us is we um, have a SOC audit every year. A SOC audit, for those on the call who might not be familiar, is a, is a service organizational control audit. And that is an audit that will help identify any gaps or weaknesses in internal controls in an organization, and it will allow for uh, you know a pathway to correct those to mitigate those risks, risks and ensure our security. So we do a number of things along those lines. Um, we also, again, just in terms of best practices, you know, we have offsite backups, uh, you know, multiple firewalls, the latest in, in antivirus and, and malware um, software, and we also. Uh, Take it a step further, we, we um, require our technology partners to do the same. Um, so if we're connecting to someone else, we like to get their stock caught and we like to hear what they're doing for security, uh, again, just to keep that chain as strong as it can be. So th those are some of the things that, that we do. Yeah, it's interesting. I just uh, recently came across uh, a statistic that 56% of organizations said they experienced a data breach caused by a vendor in 2017 but less than 50% felt that managing third-party risk was a priority. So, John, we have uh, a company that uses uh, technology, and uh, I heard something about uh, cy uh, cyber audits or cyber assessments, and is that something that this company should consider, and exactly what are those? Yeah, sure. Um, to answer the first question, yeah, it's absolutely something that this company 
should be considering. You know, I've seen it. I've seen it described that we are right now in the fifth generation of cybersecurity um, in the world. And so this is not a new issue, but it's an evolving issue. So cybersecurity as a problem for businesses um, started all the way back in the 1980s when um, data started coming into businesses on floppy disks and people started figuring out that they could um, uh, embed viruses on that, you know, on those disks through software to extract information or do damage to businesses. Um, we've seen that evolve to um, once companies went online through kind of direct attacks through the internet and companies were able to build firewalls to create defenses there. We've seen it then further evolve as people started doing business and, and work through um, uh, browsers and networks. Uh, and we've seen, we saw cybersecurity evolve there through uh, things like network intrusion, intrusion detection. We saw it then evolve again only, you know, as, as early as just a few years ago with much more sophisticated cyber attacks um, that embedded uh, uh, viruses and malware and emails and documents and images which then caused cybersecurity to then evolve again to um, uh, essentially wall off those threats when they came into an organization to try to uh, limit their reach when one of these attacks was deployed by someone clicking on um, uh, a document or an image uh, in an email. And then we've seen it now evolve again through much more broad-based systemic attacks through things like ransomware, um, and phishing, uh, and even the phishing attacks now have become uh, uh, even more, uh, even more complex and hard to recognize. That you're even trying that someone's trying to, um, trying to fish you. So all that, all that is by way of saying that as organizations deploy defenses, and I'll talk in a minute about kind of the audit and how what, what to do to kind of deploy these defenses as best we can, is that as we're deploying these defenses, um, the criminals are, uh, are evolving um, as well. And so businesses try to stay one step ahead. In reality, they're one or two steps behind, but better to be a step behind than five steps behind. But, but, let's, but really, why do we care? Okay, so that if, if I'm hacked, my business is hacked, it, 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 it's a problem for me. Okay, I get that. But doesn't it affect my credibility with my customers and isn't there a cost to all this that I should be concerned about? There's a huge cost. Um, uh, IBM, which tracks the cost of data breaches to the average American business, uh, as of 2018, estimates the cost of an average cyber attack to an American business to be approaching four million dollars um, per uh, per incident. Now, is that all? Is that all fines, John, or is that is that it's litigation? Hard, it's, hard, it's hardly fines at all. Yeah. It it is a combination of uh, the cost in remedying the attack and under. Um, uh, the 50 different data breach notification laws we have in the United States. There is no federal law that mandates that we give notifications to affected individuals upon a breach, but each state has their own uh, individual data breach notification law. So the cost of compliance with sending out notification of data breaches under these 50 different um, uh, statutory schemes, it's legal fees, it's IT fees, it's reputational uh, reputational harm. Well, that's, so it's, that's the one that I, I wanted to touch on is, is really the brand awareness because we all know, you mentioned Equifax earlier, Peter. Um, Equifax kind of became the punchline to a lot of jokes when people were talking about cybersecurity and data privacy. That's, that's hard to quantify how much money is lost. And then, you know, Equifax has Equifax, Facebook, you know, Name, name your Fortune 500 company, they have the wherewithal to, to try to repair that, to put um, procedures in place to, to fix that, their image. You know, you, you look at um, small or medium-sized, closely held businesses, if, if they are, and they are, they are the target now um, because they are the easiest access point 
into these Fortune 500 companies. Um, but, you, you know, these, these companies, they have a trusted relationship with these larger businesses. And if they are not protecting themselves and protecting those access points, and again, this, 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 uh, this um, hypothetical situation here, there's, there's many, many access points, and those ring true for just about every small and medium-sized closely held business. If they're not protecting those access points, they are leaving not only the, the fines and the litigation you were talking about, but their reputation with the people that they're in the companies that they're serving open for uh, um, liability. Yeah, you, you talked you, you talk about the small to mid-sized business. I mean, that's, we all know about the Target breach is one of the most famous cyber incidents in, in, in American business history. But the, the access point for that breach wasn't Target. It was actually Target's HVAC vendor. It was a vendor that was going into a particular Target store uh, to service the HVA system, HVAC system in that store. Um, attached a device that had been breached. So one of, the, one of the vendor's devices had been breached, attached that device to um, Target's network to service the HVAC system, and that's what exposed Target to the cyber attack. And um, hundreds of millions of dollars of damage it caused. So tell, explain, John, how uh, maybe the first step in all this is a cyber assessment or audit. Yeah, well, that, what's that in, what does that entail so, since that gets to yeah. the access? Point? Yeah, so that really is um, that really is the first step here is is evaluating through whether you want to whether you want to call it an audit or an assessment, but doing a self evaluation of what your organization's both strengths. Um, and weaknesses are from a cybersecurity standpoint. Strengths in terms of what you're doing well, um, and then weaknesses in terms of what you are not doing well, what your vulnerabilities are, and then um, how you can go ahead, um, how you can go ahead and fix those vulnerabilities. Um, the first thing you want to do is figure out for an organization is to figure out the scope of what exactly it is. That you want to uh, that you want to be testing for, um, and that's going to depend on on a lot of factors: the size of your organization, the size of your network, where your data is stored, and what types of data are stored where. To figure out um, exactly um, what it is, um, you know, what it is that you want to test. There are. Lots of systems on your network that might be entirely benign. They might not connect to more critical systems. They might not store any sensitive information or uh, uh, any of your confidential information or trade secrets or any of or any of your customers' PII, personally identifiable information. And so, in those those systems might not be as critical to test because they're more segmented, more walled off than your more sensitive systems. Um, so number one, figuring out um, what exactly it is um, you want to test, and then engaging a third party to come in and actually test for vulnerability points um, in those systems. And that would be an IT person. That would be an that would be an IT person, correct? So that would be um, that would be vulnerability scans. That would be penetration testing. That would be testing your employees for their awareness of uh, uh, recognizing what a phishing email looks like and knowing what not to click on when they get a when when they get a suspicious email. Um, making sure that uh, software um, and computers are updated. Right, that's what led to the Equifax breach was that someone had not. Uh, updated uh, or installed an update patch for their uh, for their Java software, um, which left uh, Equifax uh, exposed and the data of all of its customers uh, exposed. Um, so making sure that uh, software and systems are updated with the latest uh, with the latest and greatest updates that the providers are are putting out. Making sure and not just making sure, um, but the touch on something that. that uh, uh, David touched on not just making sure that um, you're doing this testing, but that the vendors with whom you're doing business are engaged in this, in this, um, you know, in this testing um, as well. And then once you put all these 
Yeah, and once you complete the audit, you do all this testing, you figure out where your vulnerabilities are, that's step one. Then step two is making sure that you're receiving the right kind of reporting on what these vulnerabilities are, and then once you get the reporting, um, making it, implementing uh, uh, the proper measures to make sure that those vulnerabilities, those holes, um, are sealed. Um, and then uh, doing it all over again, because this is this is well, always we, a would we process. want to. Uh, consider our vendors and have those, they, the vendors and maybe our customers to go upstream and downstream to, as to uh, their um, computer systems? Right. I mean, there's only so much. You, you obviously can't go into their businesses and, you know, and, and do the testing for them um, and do the audit or assessment for them, but what you can do is in your agreements with your customers and your vendors upstream and downstream have clauses that require them to certify to you in writing that they have complied with um, certain cybersecurity standards and taken, and taken certain measures to make sure that they're cyber compliant to a level with which you are comfortable with to do business with them, um, and then build in some liability protections as well, such that if you're breached because of something that they did not do on their end, you then shift the loss to them as opposed to you carrying the loss. Okay, so uh, WRC only has 20 employees, so employees shouldn't be an issue for them, right, John? Uh, no, employees are always an issue. Um, and I, I come at this, I'm, um, uh, aside from uh, what I do for my clients from a cybersecurity standpoint, I'm also an employment lawyer, and so I come at a lot of this from a person perspective. Um, our next session, it's going to take a much deeper dive um, in terms of uh, what we can do uh, with our, or what we should be doing, and I would almost say must be doing with our employees to make sure that they are not creating cyber liability issues for our organizations. But I view employees as the kind of low-hanging fruit for any company. Um, and so it's, um, and again, we'll talk about this in much greater depth uh, in terms of kind of do's and don'ts and policies and training at our next uh, part two of the series, but things like um, password awareness and password security and making sure that devices that your employees are using are uh, properly locked down, not just with passwords, but with secure passwords, uh, hard to crack passwords, so that your employees aren't using things like one, two, three, four, five, six, um, or all lowercase P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D, which are, believe it or not, the two most popular passwords in use currently today in America, and both of which can be cracked um, in a matter of milliseconds. Uh, so making sure your employees understand their role in uh, maintaining proper password security. Uh, making sure employees know what to do if their devices are lost or stolen. Making sure employees understand the dangers that go along um, with uh, being on a public, non-secured Wi-Fi network with your with devices that connect to your network, um, making sure employees understand what a phishing email is and looks like. If we don't know what a phishing email is, um, it's an email that is essentially designed to look like a legitimate, bona fide email, and it could be a generic kind of from Amazon or from PayPal email, or it could be a much more specific done through social engineering that is information that's publicly available about your employees out on the internet, and therefore an email designed to look like it's coming from someone within the organization, or much more targeted um, to them from a customer or a vendor or personalized from a business with whom, a uh, third party with whom they do business all designed to get the individual to click on a link uh, or an attachment in the email that will download malware or ransomware or another cyber oogly googly that will wreak havoc um, on your system. So to make sure that your employees understand what that email looks like and understand what to do if that email makes it through your spam filter. Um, and lands uh, in their inbox. Well, uh, John, you know, WRC, like a lot of businesses, uh, their employees are using their personal devices in connection with the business. Is that an issue that should be uh, 
that should be a concern? Uh, it's a huge concern um, for a number of reasons. Number one, um, uh, we, as, as an organization, WRC has less control over what's done with the device um, if it is a, because it's an external device, not a company device. Um, so there's things that employees are doing on that device um, that are going to be, uh, most certainly be um, non-work related. And just from a pure employee relations standpoint, um, it creates an issue for both the employees and for WRC if the employees don't understand that they are sacrificing a certain amount of control and a certain amount of privacy by choosing to connect uh, their personal device to WRC's network as opposed to taking an employer-provided device and just you know, carry, carrying around two phones or carrying around an extra, uh, an extra laptop um, or tablet and understanding, again, from an employee relations standpoint as, uh, as an employee that when you leave the organization that that device is going to be wiped clean which may very well result in you getting, um, you know, certain personal data like photos and other things um, wiped off that, potentially wiped off that device. So, David, um, is there any importance in the fact that WRC does business in the EU and has a manufacturer in China and seems to, you know, sell throughout North America? Absolutely. The, um, <clears throat> actually, before before I before I talk about this, this is a good good point to talk about. Uh, one thing that I wanted to make sure everyone's also realizing when we talk about um, cybersecurity and data privacy, most people think of this as you know a, a, a bad actor getting in, stealing um, personally identifiable information, and then using it somehow. Um, but the other thing that I want to remind everyone is there's also scenarios where someone is, is a bad actor is getting into a company's data and stealing that company's intellectual property that may be protected by contractually by, by trade by trade secret laws or or, or however. So I, I want to make sure that um, you're, you're also thinking in along those lines, especially in the context of the fact that WRC is going to be doing business or does business outside of the continental U.S. So basically, what you're saying is they may not know WRC would not may not know that someone's on their on their server, but that person is sitting there and taking their customers' intellectual property or their intellectual property for their use. Exactly. And unless there was some assessment on a regular basis, uh, there'd probably be no way of knowing they're there. Exactly. Exactly. Um, to get back to your original question, though, the, the EU is currently governed by the, the General Data Protection Regulation, or the GDPR. Uh, that was a, that's a framework of laws in the EU that was passed. Uh, it, became, it actually became effective in May of this year. Um, I'd be surprised if, if the majority of the folks listening in haven't seen it in the headlines or experienced it personally with uh, updates. Um, most of you when, you, when you access websites, you're being uh, now. You're being asked uh, for permission to to um, to keep your cookies or to put cookies on your computer and to uh, uh, use your personal data. That's that's directly a function of the GDPR. And um, the, so the the GDPR applies to the collection of personal data or any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. Um, and that, that natural person is, is typically a, an individual, and now here's where the GDPR becomes a little vague, and that may be intentional, and that's uh, a natural person located in the, the EU. Um, uh, and potentially that, that, that could mean that uh, they're dealing with non-EU citizens uh, that are located in the EU in their data. Um, and so a company that processes that personal data, so let's, let's talk about WRC in the context of them selling to the EU. Um, you've got an EU citizen that, that accesses WRC's website, that wants to buy one of WRC's widgets, um, they enter their name, their address, their email address, and then some credit card information. They buy the widget and, and it's shipped to their location. Um, 
in order to comply with the GDPR, uh, WRC has to, pro has to make sure that they're processing that personal data in a lawful, fair, and transparent manner. Um, WRC has to limit the processing um, and collecting only the data that's, that's absolutely necessary and, and not keeping personal data once the processing purpose is completed. Um, and and here's, the, here's the big one. Um, there, it's, it's, it's known as the right to be forgotten, and I think a lot of companies are scrambling over this, and that is um, most companies that collect data, uh, personal data or personally identifiable data, uh, they're storing that somewhere and then they're kind of forgetting about it usually or, or they're using it for marketing purposes or, or whatever. Um, with the GDPR, an individual is now able to contact WRC say, and say, um, amongst other things, that information that you collected from me, you, I want to make, you have to delete it. You have to get rid of it. That's the right to be forgotten. Um, they also have the right to go back to GDPR, correct it, uh, maybe change the, the, the address, but that, that, think of a company that collects millions of, of individuals' personal data. They would have to be able to track that, go back and, and eliminate each and every single um, a piece of that data if that person wants it to be forgotten. Um, here's the kicker, and this is why everyone's really, you know, their, their eyebrows are raising and they're sweating about the GDPR. Um, if you, are found to be in breach of the, of the GDPR, the EU can assess a fine of, of the greater of up to 20 million pounds, or 20 million euros, sorry, um, or I think it's 4% of the global gross revenue. Yeah, global glo gross revenue. Think about that in the context of a company like Facebook um, or Amazon, that's, that's huge. And so a lot, of the, a lot of the companies around here initially asked uh, or said, who cares? Uh, that doesn't affect me. It does. If you touch an individual in the GDPR and their data, you are subject to this. So um, that could be services that are done, uh, provided to a uh, consumer or citizen of the EU. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And, and you know, a lot of a lot of companies that, and we've been getting asked uh, whether or not they comply with GDPR a lot lately, um, from a lot of small to medium-sized closely held businesses. But um, you know that that can apply to to employees. If you have an employee located in the EU, you're collecting data. Um, some of that data is legally required to be collected, but you're also subject to the GDPR there. Um, and and the other thing I'll say is that some of the smaller businesses that may not even touch the EU should certainly be paying attention to the terms of the, of the GDPR because it's coming to a state near you. It, it is. California has, has recently uh, passed, I don't know when it, do you, it comes effective January 1, 2020. Yeah, it, it, the, their laws are just as restrictive, if not more, and uh, um, obligating companies to comply with, with uh, the, the strictures of, of similar laws like the GDPR. Um, so it's, it's, I guess if we're, if we're going to summarize it, we have 50 states, each of them has their own laws as it relates to data privacy. Or none. And, yeah, or, or, none. or none. And when we're dealing outside the United States, China, which a lot of companies do, or the EU, or Canada for that matter, there are regulations that the business needs to be um, cognizant of in order to do business and not get caught with potentially a major financial penalty. Correct. Correct. Canada actually has, has a law called the um, Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, which is a mouthful. Uh, but but that's actually that's also pretty similar to the GDPR as well. Uh, and given the fact that uh, those of us that are located close to Canada are probably doing quite a bit of business with them, that that, that should also be reviewed. So David, um, WRC uh, looks is looking to storing information in the cloud and doing business and um, providing. Uh, services through the cloud. Does that mitigate any potential liability or reduce its potential liability? I think it, 
it may actually increase its liability in certain circumstances. So it might be good to have a, a, a baseline understanding of what, what the, the quote unquote cloud means. So the cloud essentially is, is a, a, a data point is interacting with, or an individual or a business is storing its information on a server and the, the data is being transmitted to that server or retrieved from the server uh, via the internet. So um, why is the cloud beneficial? It's, it's, it allows you to, uh, well, you know, in the context of photos, you know, you're, you're relying on a third party. You don't have to worry about storage. Um, that's all being passed along to the third party. But back to, back to my comment saying that it, it may actually increase the liability. Um, in the context of WRC, they're, they're talking about storing their, essentially they're storing their information off-site on, on, on likely what, what's going to be servers that are owned by another company and they're going to be able to access that wire, they're going to be able to access that via the internet. Um, WRC absolutely needs to make sure that they have someone review their agreement with that company. That's number one. Number two, they need to make sure that they've looked into that company's securities practices and procedures, their cybersecurity and data privacy practices and procedures, and that the, the equipment they're using, their policies and procedures are all um, uh, up to snuff, especially depending on what, what RS, WRC is storing there. So uh, with the location of the server, those cloud servers, the third-party servers, be of interest to WRC? Absolutely, absolutely. So you, you asked about China's um, data privacy laws before, and <clears throat> that's actually a good segue into to talk a little bit about China's uh, data privacy and cybersecurity laws. And John, I think you, you can probably chime in here on some of this, but I know that uh, China's, China's latest and greatest laws require the, the storage of any of China's Chinese citizens uh, or, or, or data that, that, that is generated in China to be stored on servers physically located in China, correct? That's, that's correct. Yeah. Um, why does that present problems for, or potential problems for WRC? Well, in the past, um, China has not been the, uh, the most favorable jurisdiction or venue um, for non-Chinese companies. It's impossible. Yeah. It's, if, so, if, you, if you need to sue a Chinese company, you might as well not bother because right. it's, it's impossible. So if WRC is going to, and, and you know, that, that, that also, there's other difficulties with perhaps storing it outside of the U.S. or even in different states, for that matter, um, states that may have. Well, and, and you look at, it, at things like, you know, if you have to store data on Chinese servers, who owns the servers? Because mm -hmm. it's almost certainly going to be the Chinese government that owns the servers. And mm -hmm. now if you're an American business that you want to, uh, you know, send data over to China, are you comfortable with that data being stored on servers that are owned and open to the Chinese government um, where they could potentially um, have access to all the data that's on those servers. So it's things like your, you know, if you're having things manufactured over in China, you need to send, you know, schematics and prints and plans, which is all your intellectual property, but now you are in essence turning that data over to the Chinese government because you're storing it on their servers. But the practice point, I guess, is that if you're in the, if you're going to store information in the cloud, any business, including WRC, that is, the location of the servers, including the redundancy servers, is of importance because if the server, if your information is in India, then India's, India's law is going to control as it relates to Correct. that information. Correct. So <clears throat> if you're putting your accounting information on a server and ultimately it's not here in the U.S., then somebody else's laws are going to control access, et cetera. Correct. That's right. And, and, and I'll just reemphasize the, the, the point that um, contractually, you, you absolutely should have someone reviewing your agreement with the, the, the cloud server provider because it, it, WRC initially was storing things on their server. Anything that goes wrong is their problem. Now you've got a third party that's providing services, storage services, 
Um, it, who, who has the liability? Who has the risk here? It can be shifted contractually to a certain extent. So um, I think we'll probably deal more with that in, in, in a later webinar. So I think we've covered most of our topics for today. Um, and, uh, you know, in summary, um, don't be one of the 50% that felt that managing third-party risks is not a priority, I think, is, the, is what we got. And that um, clearly the, your business's reputation, um, as well as its financial uh, livelihood, is at risk if, not, if you don't take steps to protect it. So we appreciate you taking the time. We're looking forward to hearing from you with any questions you might have. And we uh, will um, go into a little more detail in the second part of the three-part series where we'll discuss um, more detail how to protect your business in the digital world. And in the third part, we'll discuss about what happens when you are breached because uh, as you will, I'm sure, heard, it's not if, it's when. Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, guys. That was, that was very informative. Uh, considering it's a, it's a one-on-one type webinar, you guys covered a lot of ground, and, and I'm sure a lot of folks on the call found that helpful. Um, just a reminder, too, there's a chat button on the uh, WebEx, and if anyone's got any questions, we're, we've been monitoring those um, throughout the seminar or throughout the webinar. And uh, we've got a couple questions already in. I'm going to throw these out to the panel and see where we, uh, you know, where it takes us. Um, some of these were, were potentially hit on, but it might stir some, um, some additional conversation. So one of the questions that we got, guys, was uh, what is the company's biggest cybersecurity threat? And I know, John, you talked a little bit about uh, employees maybe being a weak link, but I put that out to the panel for your your yeah, I, I think the biggest threat is the employees because they're the easiest access point and the most likely to make a mistake. Um, and when we talk about employees, and again, we'll talk more about this at our, at our second session, but you know, employees as a risk come kind of in two flavors. There's the malicious insider, the, the employee that is actually Either they're kind of hired as a double agent, they're planted in your business to do harm, or they're just disgruntled and they're looking to burn the thing down on their way out the door. Uh, but that's the much smaller category of cyber breaches that are caused by employees. The much, much larger category of risk comes from just the employee that doesn't know, doesn't understand that by clicking on that public Wi-Fi network, uh, they're potentially exposing your entire network to uh, a cyber criminal that's lurking on the same uh, on the same Wi-Fi, or doesn't understand, you know, how to recognize a phishing email or the dangers they could cause by clicking on that link in that malicious email. So, um, because they're the low-hanging fruit, and because I think studies have showed that employee mistakes are uh, always among the top one or two, uh, depending on the survey you read, causes of um, uh, of cyber breaches. To me, that's I mean that that's the largest. I think David might have a different thought. I well, I tend to agree with you in certain aspects, but I, I think that um, third-party vendors, service providers, and suppliers are are probably up there with some of the biggest risks, mainly uh, because. Well, actually, I, I, I'll, I'll break this into two categories. The, the first one is the, the third parties, um, because no, they, other than contractually protecting yourself, the business doesn't necessarily have control over them. Um, it's very easy, depending on the negotiating standpoint, to, to protect yourself contractually in that scenario. But I, I would say the other, other biggest threat is the, 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 the person or persons that control the business being in denial um, and saying that this is not going to happen to me or we've got enough protection or it doesn't apply to me. I think those are, those are probably in my... Yeah, I, I read a study uh, or white papers a couple weeks ago that said that uh, of small to mid-sized businesses, 50%, so one out of every two, devotes zero resources, zero resources to cybersecurity. Uh, that's, um, 
audits, policies, training, the whole ball of wax, zero dollars in resources to cybersecurity, and yet the same organizations uh, report that they are that they suffer a, a, at least an attempted breach. Um, uh, Twenty-five percent of them suffer an attempted breach at least one time per week. So there's a huge disconnect in corporate America right now. Now I'll just throw out that, um, and I think vendors uh, are your biggest problem, in, in, or one of the largest uh, problems. And I think uh, the next time you see your IT contractor, ask the IT contractor how they're protecting all the passwords for your uh, firm and what they're doing. I think you might be surprised what you hear. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's not home. <laughs> oh, guys, that's great. I think we have time for one more question, um, and this is a perfect segue, I think. You talked about some of the big risks. Um, when should I start worrying about cybersecurity risk? Is there, is there a certain revenue amount, employee count? Um, what activities should I be on the lookout for that really ratchets, ratchets this up on my uh, list of concerns? Not that it shouldn't be already, but what would I have to see in my business? To... I, I think it's the minute you're online and connected and someone can get in because you might not deem any of your information, you, you might not deem any of your information as worthy of being stolen. You might not, we don't store credit card information, we don't have trade secrets, we don't, um, you know, we have only a handful of employees, uh, so we don't store any information worthy of stealing on our servers or on our computers, so, who cares about us? We don't care. We don't need to care about cybersecurity. But then to go back to the example I used earlier with Target, you know, it was Target's HVAC vendor who I promise you didn't give cybersecurity a second thought um, was the entree point for a uh, uh, cyber criminal to get into uh, one of the largest retailers uh, in America. I think. I think that. Um Anytime you're doing anything uh, on the internet, you have to be concerned because it's not only them stealing, it's also what's known as ransomware. So someone could come and lock down your whole system and we're all very dependent, whether we're manufacturers or lawyers or accountants, uh, on, the, on using our system, which is all computer. And if somebody has locked it down, they may, that may be, and they just want Bitcoin in order to release it. You're out of business for that period of time. Now, you, so that, you know, if you've been down, um, downloading all your information, then maybe you can restore it and you can effectively, it's not that big a deal. But I've had clients where they thought they were <coughs> um, back, um, Rec you know, get it, uh, recording their information on a regular basis and found out their IT person hadn't downloaded it for two weeks and all of a sudden they're shut down. So I think that, and then, you know, with manufacturing, uh, a number of machines today are all based on, are connected to the Internet and applications that are in the Internet that make it operate. So if someone locks that down, you're out of business. Uh, for uh, for a considerable period of time. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, to everyone on the webinar, uh, thank you for joining Peter, David, John, and myself today. Uh, this webinar and its contents will be sent to all registrants. We will also be sending the dates and registration for the second and third episodes of this webinar series to all registrants. Have a great day, everybody.